Today, we are presenting a voice annotated presentation on acute coronary syndrome. After viewing this voice annotated presentation, you will be able to define the acute coronary syndromes, identify the clinical laboratory and electrocardiogram findings in acute coronary syndrome, manage acute coronary syndrome, and identify common complications of acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome, or ACS, refers to a clinical condition causing myocardial ischemia. These conditions are characterized by an imbalance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand. The most common mechanisms involve an imbalance that is caused primarily by a reduction in oxygen supply to the myocardium. This most commonly results from coronary artery narrowing caused by a thrombus that develops on a disrupted atherosclerotic plaque. This leads to decreased blood flow and hence decreased oxygen supply to the myocardium. Other conditions that cause a decreased oxygen supply include anemia, hypoxemia, or hypotension. A less common cause of decreased oxygen supply is dynamic obstruction, which may be triggered by intense focal spasm of a segment of a coronary artery. This is called variant angina or Prinzmetal's angina. ACS may also be precipitated by conditions that increase myocardial oxygen demand, such as fever, tachycardia, or thyrotoxicosis. There are three types of ACS, unstable angina, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and ST elevation myocardial infarction. We will talk about the key differences amongst these types in a few minutes. There are three cardinal signs and symptoms of ACS. The first is chest pain. While chest pain can be nonspecific, Factors that make chest pain more suggestive of a cardiac etiology include pain that is worsened by activity, radiates to the arms, neck, or jaw, or is associated with diaphoresis, dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, lightheadedness, or syncope. Keep in mind that chest pain may not be present in women, the elderly, diabetics, and post-heart transplant patients. These patients may have so-called silent myocardial infarctions. Another cardinal sign of ACS is abnormal cardiac biomarkers. These are substances that are released into the bloodstream when there is myocardial necrosis. The most commonly monitored cardiac biomarkers are myoglobin, troponin, and creatine kinase MB, otherwise known as CKMB. These markers vary in their time to peak levels and the amount of time that they remain elevated before returning to normal. This graph illustrates that myoglobin is the first marker to peak within two hours and also the first marker to return to normal within less than 24 hours. Troponin peaks next at 12 to 24 hours and remains positive on average up to 7 to 10 days. CKMB peaks around the same time as troponin at 12 to 24 hours but returns to normal more quickly in 3 to 5 days. Displayed here is a normal 12 lead ECG. It is beneficial to develop a standard system for evaluating ECGs such as rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, PR and ST segments, and P, QRS, and T wave morphology. The colored box shows geographical groupings of ECG leads that correspond to an anatomic location on the heart supplied by a specific vascular territory. Leads 2, 3, and AVF correspond to the inferior portion of the heart which is supplied by the right coronary artery. Leads V1 through V4 
correspond to the septum and anterior portion of the heart, which is supplied by the left anterior descending artery. Leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6 correspond to the lateral portion of the heart, which is supplied by the left circumflex artery. Here, we can compare side by side a normal ECG with an ischemic ECG. The top left panel shows a normal ECG. Note that the ST segment is at the normal electrical baseline. This is defined by the segment between the T wave and the next P wave. The top right and bottom right panels show findings seen with non ST elevation myocardial infarction, either ST segment depression or T wave inversion. The bottom left panel shows findings typical of ST elevation myocardial infarction. Note the markedly elevated ST segment with a convex or tombstone appearance. Here, we will briefly compare and contrast the three types of ACS. In unstable angina, cardiac biomarkers are negative and there may or may not be ST segment changes. This condition is due to myocardial ischemia without significant myocardial injury. In NSTEMI and STEMI, cardiac biomarkers are positive. The difference between these two entities relates to the degree of myocardial ischemia. In NSTEMI, there is subendocardial ischemia, which is reflected on ECG by ST segment depressions or new T wave inversions. In STEMI, there is transmural or full wall thickness ischemia, which is reflected on ECG by ST segment elevations. Over time, the ST segment normalizes and downward deflections at the beginning of the QRS complex form. These are called Q waves and represent dead myocardium. It is important to note that at the time of presentation, Patients with unstable angina and NSTEMI can be indistinguishable and therefore should be managed the same way. Appropriate management of ACS includes rapid identification of this life-threatening condition. As we have already discussed, the three cardinal signs and symptoms are chest pain, abnormal cardiac biomarkers, and ischemic ECG changes. Patients who present with chest pain, suggestive of coronary ischemia, should be further evaluated with 12-lead ECG and cardiac biomarkers. They should be given supplemental oxygen, full-dose aspirin chewed, sublingual nitroglycerin, and morphine. Anticoagulation is a key therapy for ACS. Patients should be treated with intravenous unfractionated heparin with a goal PTT of 50 to 70. They should also be given a thionoperidine, such as clopidogrel or prosegrel. These are potent antiplatelet agents. Thus, it is important to monitor patients for signs and symptoms of bleeding while on these medications. For unstable angina and NSTEMI, patients will often require coronary angiography with potential placement of stents. This is called percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI. Patients with STEMI should be taken for PCI immediately. The goal is to have a guide wire across the culprit lesion in the coronary artery within 90 minutes of the patient entering the hospital. This is called door to balloon time. If it is felt that a door to balloon time of 90 minutes cannot be obtained, or a local hospital does not have the ability to do PCI, then the patient should be given fibrinolysis within 30 minutes of the patient entering the hospital. This is called door to needle time. There are some situations where transfer to a center with PCI capabilities is favorable over administering fibrinolytics but this is outside the scope of this presentation. Lastly, patients should also be started on a statin, beta blocker, 
and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor as these medications improve outcomes after myocardial infarction. Even after a patient receives life saving reperfusion therapy, there are several complications that can occur after a myocardial infarction. The most common cause of death in the first several hours following a myocardial infarction is arrhythmia. For this reason, all patients with suspected myocardial infarction should be on continuous cardiac monitoring or telemetry. Damage to the myocardium often results in left ventricular dysfunction, which can lead to congestive heart failure. Within the first four to seven days, the risk for myocardial rupture is the highest. This can lead to death from compression of the heart by hemorrhage into the pericardial space. This is called cardiac tamponade. Ischemic damage to the papillary muscle may lead to rupture and resultant mitral regurgitation. More commonly in transmural infarcts, a large portion of the ventricular wall may become relatively immobile, which can lead to increased stasis and in mural thrombus formation. This predisposes to systemic thromboembolism, resulting in stroke, critical limb ischemia, or other thromboembolic phenomenon. Within the first two to three days, there is the risk for development of pericarditis. Also, at about three weeks out, an autoimmune pericarditis can develop. This is called Dressler's syndrome. Lastly, ventricular aneurysms may also occur in areas of myocardial scarring at about three to six months out. In summary, ACS or acute coronary syndrome is a spectrum of clinical syndromes due to myocardial ischemia caused by an imbalance in oxygen supply and demand. Rapid diagnosis requires the use of accurate history, ECG, and cardiac biomarkers. Treatment focuses on reperfusion and decreasing myocardial oxygen demand. Arrhythmia is the most common complication and cause of death post-MI. For more information, please see the ACC AHA guidelines listed above. That concludes this voice annotated presentation on acute coronary syndrome. Thank you for viewing.